MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. Today we're going to talk about a special case of shortness of breath. Our case is a 30-year-old woman who was about a month ago in a car accident that required mechanical ventilation, and she was discharged from the hospital. And after discharge, she developed progressive shortness of breath, and we abbreviate that SOB. And she was given albuterol, which is a rescue inhaler, by her primary care physician, but it just did not improve. And so she was being referred to our pulmonology group for progressive shortness of breath, and we ordered a pulmonary function test, which includes a flow volume loop. Well, let's talk about that flow volume loop that she had done before we even saw her. So what we're looking at here is a flow volume loop with flow going out on the positive y-axis and air going in on the negative y-axis. And we actually start right here at this far end, and after you blow all the air out of your lungs that you can possibly breathe and take a breath in, you start here and flow starts to go in, and you're breathing air in, and you are increasing the volume as it goes, and finally, until you can take no more air in and your lungs are absolutely filled up. The amount of flow going in is not the same as the velocity of the air going out. We can blow out much faster than we can breathe in, and that's why we blow out candles and not breathe in candles. This is the inhalational aspect of the flow volume loop. This is what the normal flow would be on an inhalational maneuver. And then we're asked to blow it out as hard as we can. And the first air that starts to come out is the air that's in our trachea. That's the large airway. We're going to get a large flow that is generated by those large airways. And you can see we can really blow that out hard by using our intercostal muscles to blow that out. Then at some point, we start to decrease the amount of flow that's coming out, and we start to get from the large airways into the smaller airways here, which is this last portion of it. And this is the portion that's really effort independent, and this is the rate-limiting step in getting the air out. In people with COPD, for instance, this flow rate is going to drop off tremendously and then finally taper off like this. So you'll see that kind of a pattern in COPD, but that's not what we're here to actually show. We're here to show what the normal flow volume loop until you breathe all of that air out and you get right back to point A, which is where you began. So point A is completely devoid of any kind of air in your lungs except for the air that remains in there called the residual volume. You're taking a breath in until you get it up to the highest amount that you can at B, and then you blow it out. So this is the exhalational aspect of the loop. And again, we're measuring flow here on the y-axis, and we're measuring volume on the x-axis. This is a normal flow volume loop. So let's talk about what happened in the case of our patient. This, again, here is normal. This is what she had instead. And you can see here, there is a marked reduction in the amount of air that she can blow out in terms of the flow rate. Notice that the volume is the same. So the volumes haven't changed, but the flow has. And also you can notice that there is a reduction here in terms of inhalation. So not only a reduction in flow on exhalation, but also on inhalation. And so what would it be that could potentially cause that? By the way, we call this a fixed airway obstruction. And it's fixed because it's happening both on inhalation and exhalation. There's no variability to it. It's not just on inhalation or just on exhalation. Those things actually have significant meanings, which we can talk about when we talk about pulmonary function tests. But notice here that it's happening in both inhalation and on exhalation. And that means that it's a obstruction that is fixed. It does not move. It does not change on inhalation or on exhalation. So as it turns out, what we have here is a subglottic stenosis, or an SGS. Notice what things would look like if we put a scope down and looked into someone's lungs. We're putting a bronchoscope or a laryngoscope here, and we're looking down into this airway. The vocal cords are right about here, and those are those two things that come together that forms your voice when you speak. And we're looking down this trachea. Again, this is what it looks like. So we're looking down into the trachea. Here you can see we're looking down into the trachea. And this is what it looks like in a healthy situation. Here are the vocal cords. These things come together and vibrate like two rubber bands. And that's what gives you your voice. They remain open when you're whispering. Here, with a subglottic stenosis, where there should be a nice big opening, we're noticing that there's only a small airway that does not change on inhalation and exhalation. This is going to significantly impair flow. 
And in fact, in our specific case, Our Lady was intubated because of trauma, and the tip of that endotracheal tube caused a little bit of an irritation at the tip. So normally what happens is the endotracheal tube goes in here like this, it goes past the vocal cords like this, and there is a balloon that inflates that keeps the air locked in there. And what can happen is the tip of this may sometimes irritate the side or the lining, and after a long period of time, a buildup of granulation tissue can occur. And what you will see then is this sort of a situation here, where there is a subglottic, meaning this area of the glottis, stenosis. There is a narrowing. This would be the normal airway, and it would narrow down like this and cause a web. So in the particular case of the patient that we were dealing with, yes, in fact, this is not the actual picture, but it looked very similar to this. She was breathing through about a three or four millimeter hole, in which case we took her to the operating room and we were able through the magic of lasers and ear, nose, and throat specialists and cardiothoracic surgeons who are ready to do cardiac bypass if we developed a loss of the airway. We were able to make cuts in this web and serially dilated this up and open this up so that it looked like this afterwards, and we were able to extubate her, and she was able to breathe very well. And all of it is because we understood that this is what a normal flow volume loop should look like, and this is what she had. And this told us immediately that this was a fixed airway obstruction. Knowing flow volume loops, in addition to being able to read a pulmonary function test, is really important. And I bring that up because we have a brand new pulmonary function test explained clearly course, megcram.com. It includes 1.75 CME credits that's available for continuing education units and also CE. So this covers physicians, nurses, PAs, nurse practitioners, etc. And you can see we've got some really good reviews on our course. This is the updated version of our course. If you want to know more, if you want to have that ability to be able to read pulmonary function tests, which are really important if you want to make the diagnosis of COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, other esoteric diseases, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, or even in this case of a tracheal stenosis, you've got to know the basics and we can give that to you in this course. By the time you're done, you should be able to read just about any pulmonary function test. Subscribe, turn on notifications, and join us at medcram.com. We'll put a link in the description below to that course. Thanks for joining us.